Smith. Maybe a couple of seconds and I will. Debate is an important element of progress. Welcome to Evening Reports, A View From Afar. Um, today we're joined by political scientist Paul Buchanan to discuss the Christchurch attacks, the hearings of how the voice of the victims has been heard. But what are security intelligence errors that failed to identify the killer Brenton Tarrant? Prior to the attacks, we just did not know and our, our intelligence agencies did not know what was in store. How did they fail to notice his comprehensive planning, his surveillance and online threats? We will also discuss how white extremism as a global threat and how they use social media and leaderless resistance tactics. And what of solutions? What can be done so terrible acts of mass murder cannot happen again in New Zealand? But first, here's an invitation to those of you who have joined us live. If you are joining us via Facebook, Twitter or YouTube, feel free to make comments. If you do, we'll be able to include your interaction in the programme. So let's cross to Paul, who is waiting to discuss these issues with us. Good afternoon, Paul. Hi, Solon. How are you doing? So what, what do you make of the, um, the court cases um, down in Christchurch at the moment, the hearings where the victims have been reading their, 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 their impact reports to the court, but most significantly the way they've addressed Tarrant himself? Uh, well, certainly their voices needed to be heard, uh, if not by the killer himself, and certainly by the judge uh, when he determines sentence. I mean, it may be the case that the sentence is is already predetermined, uh, life without parole, from what I understand, for, you know, first for New Zealand. Uh, but uh, it's very clear that the, the survivors, the families of the dead, uh, needed to address uh, this person uh, for a number of reasons, not only to show him uh, that he could not prevail, he will not prevail, he and his and other people who think like him, uh, but also that uh, the damage that he's done. I mean, I think we need to put human faces on this now. It needs to be on the record, doesn't it? And they deserve their opportunity to address the courts, and it's obviously been very helpful to them uh, on many levels. Uh, it has. And, and, and let's be very clear here. New Zealand, once again, has uh, demonstrated remarkable compassion, remarkable respect uh, for these victims and their families uh, within the judicial process. So, uh, again, there's a lot of lessons to be learned for the good here. Now, I will point out that, from what I understand, uh, the killer will not address the court. Mm. A, a written statement, apparently very brief, will be read out by his uh, court-appointed lawyer. Yeah. Uh, but he's going to remain silent, and that's interesting because one of the big fears mm. on the part of the authorities was that he would try to use the sentencing hearing as a bully pulpit, mm. uh, much the way Anders Breivik did in Norway. His trial. Yes. Well, before before we get into that, Paul, let's have a look at the victims, uh, just a couple of examples of what was going on in the court this week when the victims and those that uh, were able to read their victim impact reports to the court and to Tarrant, Tarrant himself. Um, you watch this. This is from the ABC in Australia. She wore her sorrow on her sleeve. I want to hear his voice. I want to hear my dad's voice. My Baba's voice. But this spellbinding address from a young school teacher was also full of scorn. Those that fight with guns, cowards. You know you're not strong. You know you're weak. Look at yourself. Just one of many people to taunt the gunman on another powerful day in court. And coming back to this maggot, I would like to say that my 71-year-old dad 
would have broke you in half if you challenged him to a fight. John Milne's son was killed by a bullet to the head. He was 14. The perpetrator, he said, didn't belong in his country. So, Paul, you can uh, see um, exactly um, what Tarrant was observing. And uh, at one point earlier this week, um, they say uh, with the impact report that one of the mothers was reading and directly to him where she expressed um, that she had no hate in her heart relating to him as a human being, um, that there was a response, and perhaps one of the only responses from the killer, Tarrant, um, where he acknowledged her words, her thoughts, with a nod, um, began to blink repeatedly and wiped what appeared to be a tear from his eye. What do you make of that? That's, that was perhaps a, a, a big moment in trying to figure out how is this guy going to be reacting through the week? Uh, well, I was somewhat surprised by that particular uh, incident. Uh, you know, the, the problem, Selwyn, is that because he agreed to uh, plead guilty to, uh, you know, 51 counts of murder, 40-something counts of grievous bodily harm or whatever the, the legal term was, we're never going to really hear uh, what his specific motivations were. I mean, we've seen his manifesto. Uh, but unfortunately, it may be the case that um, he was in a moment, uh, there's, there's speculation that he was taking a lot of steroids uh, because he was bodybuilding and he was you know, in a constant state of rage. Well, that, that's right. You know, you look at the size of him now compared to when he first appeared in the courts in the initial hearings in 2019. He was beefed up, short guy, a very short dude, right? But beefed up, clearly had been working out to the max. Now, he, as one of the victims, uh, survivors, referred to him as is, he's a shell of a human being. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just think it would have been interesting uh, to know if, in fact, he, uh, he he was in this perpetual state of rage. And uh, there had to be other people who knew of some of his proclivities. And this is, this is the only criticism I'm really going to offer this judicial process, is that when he agreed to plead guilty, he removed the possibility for his defense team to cross-examine members of the police and of the intelligence services as to what they knew about his activities prior uh, to the attacks of March 15th, 2019. And I say that because, uh, A, I happen to believe that he could not have planned so meticulously in utter secrecy, that there had to have been other enablers, maybe not accomplices. Others out there that were assisting or at least were privy to it. We know online, for example, that through the Chan sites, he, he, he had a, quite, quite a cohort of followers there. Um, and we know that his discussions immediately going off to commit these heinous atrocities um, was directly to them. So we're getting to that point, Paul, and you know, um, our second point here, and what of New Zealand's security intelligence agencies and also, you know, those of our partners around in the Five Eyes type situation, aren't they supposed to pick this thing up? They, we, we understand from what was presented in the courts earlier this week that he, he had drone surveillance running in January, two months before these attacks, on the 9th of January, I think it was, um, with drones are above the... Um, Well, we just lost Paul. We'll just oh, we got Paul back now. Okay, Paul, we just lost you for a moment. What are, what is this saying? You know, what of our um, security intelligence um, uh, agencies and those of our Five Eyes partners, where they didn't pick up all this, as you would say in intelligence terms, chatter. Um, they, they, they failed to pick up his comprehensive planning, which include drones um, above the mosques of which two months later he committed these atrocities. They, that's overt surveillance he was doing, parked across the road, flying a drone across. What do you make of all of that, and what can we learn from it? Uh, well, there. Uh, let's let's start broad and then get down to the specifics. Yeah. The, uh, there had to have been individual, institutional, and systemic failures for this to occur. Mm. It wasn't just that he uh, he got a gun license when he probably should not have gotten a gun license. Uh, that's on 
you know, that fault belongs to an individual police officer uh, who didn't vet them. But there's institutional and systemic hmm. problems. And the systemic problems are worldwide. Uh, what has basically happened since 9-11, up until uh, the March 15th attacks, is that Western intelligence agencies were focusing on the global specter of jihadism to the exclusion of white supremacists, violent white supremacist movements, which were considered to be matters of local law enforcement. Mm. The operative problem was that the authorities, let's say in Germany or in the UK, discounted the threat of white extremists. They thought they were just a bunch of losers and loonies, mm. and they left it to local police forces to handle. They didn't share intelligence on these people and what have you, uh, to the point that in the United States, they didn't share intelligence between different states. And that was also the case here. Although the police have infiltrated white white supremacist gangs, they've done so because these gangs are involved in the drug trade. Yeah, probably. Their, their informants and whatnot are looking for drugs, not for ideology. So with this guy, you've got ideology, a hate crime in the waiting. That falls into not just police intelligence, obviously, but also New Zealand Security Intelligence Service. You would imagine that our counterparts in Australia would have been able to pick up chatter. Why was everybody asleep at the wheel? Um, you, you've been, for example, uh, um, on um, a body that was attached to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, which examined the performances of our our, our agencies. What, what? What? How do you? How, how do you? What do you make of all of this? Well, think of it this way: uh, after 9/11, money and resources flowed. Mm. to uh, counter-terrorist uh, 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 units, but flowed in the measure that they focused on uh, jihadism, both at home and abroad. And with a limited resource pie, what got downplayed in the priority scheme of things was the very real threat of white supremacists taking up arms and committing acts of terrorism. So if we look at that point... Is, was the emphasis on our elected governors, with those that had the responsibility to govern our intelligence agencies, do you believe that they should have been targeting, target funding, if it comes down to money, that they ought to have instructed our intelligence agencies, this cannot be just one ethnicity that you're going after here. We've got to look at the whole gambit. The whole, the whole lot. Well, that clearly was not done, or it was disproportionate. The Muslim community became a fixation hmm. for the New Zealand intelligence community. And as it turns out, they wound up being the victims. Hmm. Uh, I pointed out uh, in some of my writing that neither before or after 9-11 has any Muslim in New Zealand been arrested, charged, much less convicted for an act of ideologically motivated violence? And on that point, too, myself as a journalist had an approach by different people that our intelligence agencies had used to infiltrate various mosques up here in the Auckland area of New Zealand, where one of them in particular felt that He'd been left high and dry by the intelligence agencies that a lot of the work was dangerous but meaningless. That, you know, he, he, he got to the point where he felt like he was betraying the people he was supposed to be watching and started to actually do the rounds of some journalists that he thought he might be able to get his word out there. So it sounds like that obsession that you're talking about, if, it, it's a, it, if that's the proper way of paraphrasing this, that our intelligence agencies had at the behest, obviously, of over um, other um, external powers um, that involved themselves with New Zealand's foreign policy and internal policies, that the whole thing was perhaps a waste of energy, a waste of resource and a waste of time. Is that fair to say? Uh, well, in retrospect, it certainly appears to be so. I mean, let's be very clear. There are probably about two dozen uh, young Muslim men who are very angry, uh, vent on social media, and deserve to be uh, deserve to be watched. 
Uh, there are two in jail for distributing beheading videos. Uh, that's the extent of the extremism that has been prosecuted uh, here in New Zealand with regards to is Islamic extremism. But what's really bothersome uh, is that, for, for example, I've been here since 1997. Within six months, given that I do security things, I knew uh, very active white supremacist communities, yeah. uh, particularly in Christchurch. Yeah, but and the swastika is, is a pretty easy way to identify. Yeah, yeah. 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 especially when and, it's tattooed on the side of the head or something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and and the thing is, they were violent. They they they've always been violent. Uh, their normal type of violence is the street violence of singling out a person of color, someone who's clearly a recent immigrant, and beating them up in the streets. Uh, that was usually the way these white supremacists rolled. Uh, so they're well known to the police. Again, they're involved in the drug trade. And so the question is, given their historical penchant for violence, in actuality, real proven violence, and given the fact that for all the concerns about keyboard jihadists, uh, there had been no act of violence, politically motivated violence, committed by a Muslim in New Zealand. Why didn't they look at these these white supremacists uh, that uh, that the killer surrounded himself with? He was, you know, again, he was not alone. When he went to the gun range, he went with other skinheads, and they shot at human targets. They shot with military-grade weapons. And so the fact that the police may have known uh, of this guy in the context of having infiltrated uh, white supremacist groups uh, personal into criminal investigations, uh, why they just let him slide under the radar, given that, again, as you pointed out, he was doing things like running surveillance drones over the mosque that he eventually was going to attack. Okay, you know, you, you, you're responding with whys as well. Have you well, heard anything to date? that would satisfy you that we are going to be in a much more vigilant situation, a broader kind of uh, approach to risk that may be here that isn't specifically targeting the colour of one's skin and the religion of which one follows? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, there has been a shake-up. We may never find out the details of it, but certainly in the wake of March 15th, the threat horizons, the threat assessments are going to be much more broad-based. Broad and I'll, I'll point out that uh, in July, before the attack, so July of 2018, uh, the police were constituting a white supremacist task force. So uh, unfortunately, they couldn't prevent this attack, but the, uh, the threat of white supremacists was at least on the police's radar. Uh, nine months before these attacks, and they simply were not able to, to work. But the other thing is this. I mean, I've, in one way or another, I've been doing counterinsurgency, counterterrorism uh, since the late 1980s. And in, uh, in a lot of the old-fashioned literature about uh, what motivates people in, to commit acts of terror, uh, there's the simple formula that you look at people's behavior. Uh, you don't look at their skin color. You don't worry about the specific ideology. Yep. And here's, here's, it's a vulgar way of putting it. But back in the day, one of the old hands that I worked with said, okay, what's the common denominator of terrorists of all stripes? Marxist-Leninists, jihadists, you know, all of them. They're young men. They're by and large 99.9% .9 young men and uh, here, pardon my French, but the vulgar part is, and they can't get laid. These guys don't have girlfriends. They don't have, they're estranged from their families. Uh, and so they, they retreat into darkness. Uh, and they start looking for uh, explanations for why their situation, their personal situation. If people is, think you're being extreme yourself on that, in the wake of the deterrent um, committing his atrocities in New Zealand, we found that there are groups exactly what you're talking about and of which you know he, he subscribed to. So it, while it might sound like a, a little bit of a, a slap, it's a, it's a reality of the strange psyche that is going on with some of these people. Look, let, let's, let's discuss the white extremism globally. Um, we'll just take a quick transition break. 
get back and let's get into that so we can really dig down into what is ticking, how, how the... Uh, how, how white extremists go about their thing, what are the things we can observe as reasonable human beings to make sure this type of thing um, doesn't go unmissed in the future. So yeah, welcome back, um, Paul. Now, yes, um, so... How white extremism as a global threat, how, do, how does that present itself? What is the makeup of it and the hate ideologies, obviously, that are attaching to those that subscribe to it? Okay, well, philosophically, um, the current version of white supremacy, especially in its, its extremist form, is based on two things. Uh, the first one, the fundamental one, is something called replacement theory. These are individuals who think that the white race uh, and all of its variations is being replaced by darker hues, and that Western civilization is going to fall unless it fights. Uh, they would rather die fighting, this is their language, uh, rather than submit to the rule of the dark hordes. And you and I may think that this is sort of nuts, but that's what makes them dangerous, is they truly believe that they're going to go and extinct if they don't fight back. And so hmm. the second leg of this philosophy, if you will, is something known as acceleration theory, that while whites can still fight, they have to commit acts of violence to accelerate the social contradictions in heterogeneous societies, to bring the class of civilizations to its head, Mm. and provoke an all-out racial war while whites can still prevail. So this sounds like Charles Manson. And uh, very much so, and, and, and Charles Manson was a white supremacist. Mm. Uh, again, another evil genius, mm. uh, of which there if, now we've you know, a few more. If we roll it back, you know, to, you know, the expressions of Nazism, anti-Semitism, all of these isms that are based on hate, it seems that... If we look right back to the Nazi era in, in Germany, there was a long lead-in of social conditions, economic conditions, the loss of a nation's identity. You know, we can observe the rise of nationalism, national socialism, from all so many complex different angles. Is there a, a social, environmental, a economic, a, a purpose or a reason that makes sense that we're seeing the rise of this in our world today? Uh, yes, usually when you see the rise of extremisms, particularly when they take on the form of large social movements like the Nazi movement, it's during periods of socioeconomic transition on a large scale. So the deepening of uh, capitalism in the wake of the uh, First World War, you know, it was you had a depression and then a rebuild that was done under state ages. Uh, more recently, we've got the Great Recession and the dislocations that have occurred as a result of that. Massive demographic change in Europe uh, based on both legal and illegal immigration. And so those times of transition are when you see extremism emerge. The thing is, extremists need scapegoats. Yeah. And so and it goes back to what I was saying about the lonely guy in his mother's basement. He He's trying to make sense of why his life is no good. Hmm. Why, he why it sucks. It. Everything stinks. Yeah. And so if, if an ideology comes to him via the computer and it says, look, it, it's not your fault. It's the Jews' fault. It's the Muslims' fault. It's, you know, it's ev people's everybody's fault. fault. Everybody else. Everybody uh, else. In particular, Everybody these people that they label as an invader or something like that. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. And a lot of, let's be honest, some of the uh, uh, conspiracy channels and whatnot are very sophisticated in their presentations. And so you give these guys, because they are, again, 99.9% .9 young men, men under 30. You give them an explanation for why their lives are miserable, but worse yet, you give them a solution, mm. which is armed violence against those scapegoats. And that gets to the third leg of the current 
white extremist movement, which is leadership re resistance. This dates back to the 1960s, again, uh, a theory first uh, promoted by a U.S. right-winger mm -hmm. uh, back then. And basically it says, in order to avoid the law enforcement authorities, you've got to break down into so-called lone wolf or small cell yeah. operational units. And the communication between them doesn't occur in a pub. It doesn't occur in a clubhouse. It occurs online increasingly via social media. Encrypted? And, um, out of the eyes of surveillance agencies or able to be identified, do you think? Well, that's part of the solution. You know, we're, we're yeah. you know, going to think about possible solutions. There's a major conundrum here, but only for democracies. And that is, is that a lot of these social media platforms, their business model is based on holding the privacy of their their users now we know that the targeted advertising that we see on a lot of social media uh sure they have our data and they're using it for their own purposes but they're not sharing it with law enforcement because that violates the privacy agreements that many of us sign now it's going to be very hard to get large social media platforms that are making billions of dollars based on this business model to turn around and start self-reporting to law enforcement some of the strange chatter that they see on their various platforms. And that's been the stuff of debates uh, for years now, but particularly since March 15th, trying to get the likes of Facebook and Twitter yeah. to report things. And they're slowly coming around. Slowly coming around. You know, when we were preparing to go simultaneously to Facebook, to Twitter, to, Yahoo, um, to, to YouTube, um, and onto the various sites just prior to this program. You line up the subject matter, you put your headline in, et cetera, et cetera. YouTube was the only one I was having difficulty with, and I had to change some of the um, wording in the, in the title. And I suspect, it's the first time it's happened, I suspect that their algorithms were thinking, what, what is this that's starting to present to go live? And it's talking about white supremacism and, and, and terror things. Um, now, its algorithms may have adjusted and we're able to advance with the show. But, you know, it seems that, you know, we're going live to Facebook now, um, you know, and, and thankfully we're able to put our show to that audience that's there. Um, but is it working? Really, the, this tragedy relating to answering that, is it working, relating to banning or blocking, is when a potential atrocity is going to occur and, and, and is it um, able, able to um, go? We don't know the answer to that, do we? No, I mean, my hope is, uh, and, 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 and admitting that it runs the risk of having this sort of bulk collection of people's information, hmm. uh, that these, these platforms, particularly the encrypted platforms, will work hand in hand with law enforcement when they start seeing signs of something that looks out of yeah. the usual, untoward, and perhaps dangerous. Yeah, the problem's uh, in the dark net area, isn't it? You know, and and, and that's that's something you know for a whole program if we get into that. Look, this is a global phenomenon too. It's not just obviously New Zealand. We've, we, you know, uh, uh, the, in the last two days, the United States once again is confronting itself over some of these issues. Let's just have a quick look at a clip by um, by Deutschwelle here several others injured in Kenosha, Wisconsin, as anti-racism demonstrators gathered for a third night. Footage posted online showed what appeared to be a civilian armed with a rifle firing shots when, uh, when he tripped after being chased by demonstrators. At least one person fell to the ground. There were also uh, reports of multiple shots in other locations at the same time. Uh, police and demonstrators have been facing off for the last three days as anger spills onto the streets following the shooting by police on Sunday of Jacob Blake, a black yes. resident. Jacob Blake Paul. So this is, um, once again, you know, the situation in the United States has flared up because of what appears from this distance, a view from afar, if you like, is that the police overreacted. They've reached into a, to a vehicle. They've shot this guy multiple times in the back. He has survived and is stable in hospital, but not for... <laughs> their, their efforts are obviously some, uh, intended to achieve a different outcome. 
And now we're seeing once again this type of racial division. And what stands out to me here, Paul, is reportage coming from the United States New Zealand time this morning, is that the young teenager that has been charged with murder here that fired the shots after he tripped, he and his group had actually sought the um, deputising from the sheriff of the city. That their militia, their armed militia, was wanting to go out and supposedly protect um, buildings and facilities from those in the Black Lives Matter movement. Where is this going and what can you make of that? Uh, well, the United States, unfortunately, uh, is, is the worst example of some of the trends that we've discussed today. That young man uh, is, uh, by all accounts, a white supremacist. He uh, was part of an irregular militia that drove up from Illinois up to Kenosha, armed themselves uh, with long arms, and then were patrolling, quote unquote, the streets in support of the police. And uh, at some point were confronted with protesters and he opened fire and then he walked through the police lines. They let him go, uh, got in his car and drove back to Illinois where he was eventually arrested. Well. The organization of these militias occurs online. Uh, again, they meet in the streets of Kenosha. They've never met each other before, or they've met at other mm. counter-protests. For those that are watching outside of the United States, this, this particular program, can you explain to us the militia? Because for many in countries like New Zealand, Australia, and, and to a degree Britain, we're thinking, what's this militia? We thought it was from the Wild West days. Well, they're, uh, because of the Second Amendment, uh, a 17-year-old can, in fact, have an AR-15, which apparently was the weapon he had in his hands. Yeah. Uh, there is a right to constitute, duly constitute militias that dates back to the Constitution. Uh, you would think that they don't need them anymore, but because the militias are mostly uh, uh, white supremacists of one sort or another, uh, people who uh, believe in this replacement theory, they're arming themselves and defending themselves against what they think is the usurpation of uh, their rights as white people. And again, we may look at this as being very confused to be charitable, hmm. uh, but it's dangerous. They have yeah. the ability to take these weapons into the streets. I thought the sheriff of Kenosha made a good point uh, in the wake of the shooting. He said, we had gotten a request to allow militias to come up in support of our police, and I said, heck no. Yeah. And the reason for that is what happened last night. Hmm. You know, we don't want these cowboys walking around. They're, they're antagonistic towards the protesters. Yeah. You know, they're out there not because some innocent man was shot in the back seven times. They're out there because they don't like Black Lives Matter. And it seems, you know, from as you detailed the response from the police when this guy you know, two, two um, Black Lives Matter people are down on the ground, one's dead, and this guy kind of walks toward them with his arms up with his rifle, assault rifle, still draped across his body, and they say, keep going, get out of the way. You know, they're obviously seeking out getting those other guys. Look, let's take a transition. We'll get into some where you think um, the solutions may lay, and if there are other anything in history, a comparative element to the politics of all of this, which provides an insight toward where things could go for a better outcome. We'll just um, be right back with you, Paul. Yeah, Paul, solutions. It's the biggest question on everybody. It's the burden for everybody, isn't it? You know, but if you're looking at it from the point of view, you know, you know, your specialty in comparative politics, for example, what can history teach us that can give us some sort of understanding and ability and what is required to truly uh, address some of the hate that exists in our world today? Well, obviously, you know, if we go from the operational to the more societal uh, uh, approaches. Um, there has to be better intelligence uh, sharing between law enforcement authorities, security agencies, and again, social media companies. Uh, there, there simply has to be much better collaboration when it comes to these threats and early detection. 
You know, we cannot allow things to fester mm. online to the point that someone's provoked into violence one way or another. And so some of these dodgy, uh, uh, you know, uh, discussion boards and what have you where extremists congregate should be an absolutely feeding ground for the signals intelligence uh, people of, uh, you know, any number of countries. Uh, and I'll say again. The, the conundrums for d democracies, authoritarian-run countries, and now there's a majority of authoritarian-run yeah. countries in the yeah. world, they don't have to worry about civil liberties. They don't have to worry about free speech. Uh, they can shut things down. Singapore is a really good example of that. Um, they're not having a bar of this sort of stuff. 8chan, 4chan, they're gone. So it's a feather in their cap. Uh, you know, I would never trade living here in this liberal democracy for living in Singapore, and I've lived in both places. Yeah. But the Singaporeans are like, you know, we need social harmony. Uh, you know, we're not going to allow uh, people to come in and try to divide us on, you know, racial grounds uh, to promote violence against you know, It simply will not happen. So authoritarians do have an advantage in that regard, but that doesn't mean to say that liberal democracies can't respond forcefully on national security grounds to what are essentially domestic terrorist threats. Exactly. Literally, We've got the apparatus, if they're actually doing the job properly, um, to be able to address this. Yeah, because again, the behavioral characteristics of the people who are prone to commit these acts of violence, think of, for example, the guy who shot up the Jewish community center in Pittsburgh, uh, the guy who attacked Mexicans in, in and around El Paso. Uh, all of these people display certain common behavioral characteristics. And I guess if the law enforcement can't detect them in the first instance uh, because of things they say online or things they do, then it's incumbent upon their families, their neighbors, their friends, their schoolmates to alert people to the fact that something's off. And uh, if, 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 for example, they have not yet committed a crime, but all of the behaviours and the precursors toward that happening. How does societies, how does a liberal democracy, how do the enforcement agencies address that? Well, I think that there needs to be a re-emphasis placed on uh, the sort of multicultural, heterogeneous nature of modern societies in which the narrative is not one of division and polarization. not that many liberal democratic governments push that line, uh, but unfortunately one does, and that's the Trump administration. Yeah. Uh, but to reinforce the commonalities that bind people in a liberal democracy, you know, where freedoms are in fact cherished, and most importantly, to emphasize to would-be extremists that, uh, you know, diversity is the spice of life. You know, there's no threat to their way of existence uh, by adding into the mix non-white people. I mean, you know, and, and in some ways, that was the message that came through so strongly from those survivors and the, those that have suffered great bereavement at the hands of Brenton Tarrant, that they were saying, your actions did not divide us. You made us more one with the people in which we live in, with in this city, in this country. Yeah, and I, and I think to, to its credit, this government... Uh, has been very good from the top down to emphasize that uh, we won't be divided along racial lines, uh, which was one of the, the intentions of this particular fellow. But let's also be clear, mm. um, outside of the court in Christchurch today, yep. there are protests, counter-protests, or white supremacists saying that it's all a hoax, that it's a conspiracy, that no one died, that this is all a deep state false flag operation. Yeah. There are those people, and that's the danger, is those people may be nuts, but they can be dangerously nuts. You know, I, um, in the days after the Christchurch massacre on March 15 last year, I was asked and I wrote a, a, a feature piece, if you, for want of a better word, for Cicero magazine in Germany. In the wake of that, it was published in German, and, uh, and the English version published on Evening Report here in New Zealand. Within a few hours of it being published in English, an individual from Christchurch emails me under the name SS Savage, 
<laughs> doing all sorts of legal threats of why a photo in there should be taken down. You know, it, it exists. To ignore it, to allow it to not be confronted, allows it to breathe. And um, I, I guess that's one of the strong messages here of yourself. The vigilance is a way of addressing it. Yeah. Yeah, there, um, there's an old saying in Spanish that translates into silence is acquiescence. Yeah. And so if we sit silently and watch these, let's say, these, these counter-protesters uh, and don't take a closer look at them, we're, we're enabling them. You know, again, we're not accomplices. Mm. And that's the, the one encouraging thing is my understanding is that as this ramped up to the sentencing hearing, the intelligence agencies and the police have reinvigorated their monitoring of social media and extremist chat rooms and that sort of thing. Because they're afraid there's going to be a spike in this and that there may be a copycat, you know, to celebrate uh, this event. And so there, I, I, I feel confident that they are on the ball, uh, making sure that would-be imitators don't get a chance to act. The thing is, we have to do that continuously. Never take the eye off. And never take the eye off. And, and do, you know, do, do we as individuals have to forego a degree of civil liberty and have the eye of the state probe our lives even more than it, do, it does today um, to, to pay for the ability to basically prevent this type of thing from happening? Yeah, I think, you know, we just need to understand, and you and I have talked about this in the past, that along with our democratic rights and freedoms come responsibilities. Yep. And just like you don't yell fire in a movie theater, hmm. you don't go online and start uh, you know, advocating violence against people uh, because they happen not to look like you. Um, you know, that, again, it's the behavior. And I'll give you, a, for instance, uh, one of the biggest terrorist threats here in New Zealand is from environmental activists who don't like government poisoning programs uh, the so-called anti-1080 crowd, uh, the people who are most at threat by uh, these folk who are prone to violence are Department of Conservation workers who do the actual deployment mm. of these 1080 poisons to control, you know, ver vermin and what have you. And in a way, it's, a, it's, a sh it's more than a shame because it takes away the ability to actually debate the merits or otherwise of 1080. Yeah, yeah, but... What, what I find interesting is that uh, the concerns about anti-1080 activists turning to violence, and they have. Mm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not just you know, speculating here. They have. They've gone after Department of Conservation workers yep. where they live. Uh, is that the police and the Department of Conservation focused on their behavior. Right. You know, the, the anti-1080 you know, nutters, uh, maybe mostly white, but that wasn't, you know, a yeah. part of the equation. It was their behavior. And so if you go back to looking at behavioral characteristics, and some people say, well, that's profiling. Yes, but it's profiling on potentially criminal behavior, not on how you look or, you know, who you worship or that sort of thing. That's just good police work. That's just good intelligence work. And so if we do that, if we reorient our threat assessments based on the behavior of individuals and communities and then marry that to whatever cause they happen to be espousing, then you can get much better early detection of the talkers versus the walkers. Let's, Again, call, call, let's call it on that. You can't lead off the program on a better point than that, Paul, I don't believe. Um, We've extended the program so that we can accommodate the debate in a deeper level, and I think it's been well worthwhile. So thank you for your contribution, Paul. Thanks once again for being with us um, for, the, for the week. And thank you to everybody that um, has joined us live, and also for those that um, will watch this after it becomes video on demand. And uh, we look forward to bringing another program of View From Afar with Paul Buchanan and myself um, around this time next week. And until then, take care.